Thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm not, I'm hoping to not just like talk for 45 minutes straight here. Like I, I'd like to leave some time at the end for um, question and answer and stuff. Um, uh, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I'm happy to, for this to be kind of interactive as well. Um, if you have questions or whatever, don't hesitate to like raise your hand and I'll call on you when I'm good and ready. And, um, uh, and I might be like, oh, actually, I'm going to talk about that next. So, you know, but whatever. Um, so I want this to be a, a back and forth. Um, so my name is Darius Kazemi. Um, I am a, a, a longtime Fediverse implementer and studier, I guess. Um, I wrote, uh, um, I maintain a fork of Mastodon called Hometown. Um, I've written a bunch of um, open source software to help developers develop better Fediverse software. Uh, and uh, I wrote a guide called Run Your Own Social that a lot of people still use when it's when they when they're trying to figure out how they're going to start up their own um, uh, Fediverse server. Um, a while back, someone once someone asked me, uh, you know, if you could make a sequel to Run Your Own Social, what would it be about, like a 2.0? And my answer to them was, it would probably be about like governance, like how to run a server once it gets to like more than a handful of people. Um, and I didn't really think too much about it, but then um, Erin Kissane, who's someone uh, uh, who does great work, um, you might be familiar with her um, recent-ish, she wrote like a 40,000 word blog series called Meta in Myanmar about Meta's complicity in the genocide in uh, Rohingya Muslims in, in uh, Myanmar. Um, and Erin approached me and said, hey, there's this thing called Digital Infrastructures Insight Fund. They have a, a fellowship or a grant. They have a grant uh, program. Do you want to go in with me on uh, something about governance? Uh, and I said, yes, absolutely. So um, we applied. We got the grant, uh, which is which is very, I'm very grateful for. And we got to spend six months working on um, this project, uh, which is uh, ultimately, it's not published yet, but it will be published like soon weeks, not months soon, maybe even days, you know, but so, um, and um, uh, the, the, the overall report is called Governance on Metaverse Microblogging Servers, because we figure we're not going to come up with a fancy name for it. If one, I might wake up in the middle of the night in the next couple of weeks and go, wait a minute, I got it, I got the fancy name. Um, but um, basically, uh, what Aaron and I wanted to do was, I'll just read from this because this is directly from the report and we spent time thinking about this. Um, we're, we were trying to establish how governance happens across servers and teams on the Fediverse. Um, specifically, we were interested in what we call small to mid-size Fediverse servers. Um, uh, uh, and, and we were, and I'll define governance in a little bit, but basically six month study, um, we actually limited ourselves to Mastodon and hometown servers on the Fediverse, and that's partly because we didn't have enough resources to like learn new to us software and learn the, there's a lot of like um, uh, context you have to bring to these sorts of things. And Aaron and I were both familiar enough with Mastodon and also hometown being a fork of Mastodon um, that we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to focus on people running that software because we know it. Um, and we don't have to like, I didn't want to like study some other piece of Fediverse software and miss out on like really critical um, uh, nuances essentially. So, so we sort of stuck to what we knew there. Um, we focused on um, servers of 80 to 10,000 community uh, members, although um, Really, 2,000 was our upper bound, and we, but we talked to a couple of people in the 10,000 range just because we wanted to test how different that was uh, from the main range there. Um, and we ended up talking to 16 server operators across 11 teams. Server operator, broadly, is just anyone who's on the staff of a server, so that could be an admin, it could be um, a moderator. It could be someone, we talked to a community manager, actually. There was one group that had like a dedicated community manager, which was pretty cool. Um, and we also talked to two advisors to IFTAS, which is the um, Independent Federated Trust and Safety Organization, I want to say. I might get the individual letters there wrong at the moment. Uh, but they're a group that started up in the last year trying to um, provide a unified um, organization for people who work on trust and safety issues in 
federated social media, and I can answer questions about them um, later. Um, but uh, we ended up conducting about 30 hours of interviews, um, and uh, we, we put out, ultimately, it's going to be like a 115-page report with uh, like a couple of smaller reports for people who don't want to read 150 pa 115 pages. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll open this with a fun fact, which is that governance comes from the Greek kubernau, which means to steer, which gives us cybernetics and also Kubernetes. So we wanted to put this fact in the report and our editors were like, no, it's too nerdy. And I was like, well, I'm at Fosse. I'm gonna put the nerdy fact in for you all. Um, you know, just gotta get it out there somewhere. Um, I want, and over the course of doing this, we didn't start with like a specific set of definitions for governance, but in the course of talking to our interviewees, we uh, came up with um, kind of three main pillars of governance on when you're running a, a federated social media site uh, that we sort of uh, put everything in. And so the first pillar was what a lot of people might think about, which is moderation. Um, and broadly speaking, I would say moderation is the governance of server members and content going in and out of that. Um, so this could, and by governance of server members, I also mean like um, community management, uh, because there's not just, you know, when, uh, when places like Facebook talk about moderation, they mean um, getting rid of illegal content or content that violates the code of conduct and that kind of thing. But um, on, on these servers of, of 80 to thousand people uh, there's as much work doing community management and making sure that people are being nice to each other or nice to people other servers or whatever um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of that kind of governance that happens that gets um, that doesn't really fall under the trust and safety banner um, trust and safety is kind of an industry term for the more um, uh, mass content moderation type stuff um, Another pillar was server leadership. So we were, we, were, we were concerned with the governance of a given server and also the, the meta governance of the people running it. So we talked to some servers that operated as um, sort of direct democratic cooperatives. Um, we talked to a couple of um, sort of the traditional BDFL model uh, type, of, uh, type of situations. Um, we also, yeah. Thank you, yes. Uh, BDFL, uh, Benevolent Dictator for Life. Um, and we discovered that most of the Benevolent Dictator for Life uh, BDFL places were actually BDFN, Benevolent Dictator for Now. Um, no one really wants to be Benevolent Dictator, but they don't really see a path to getting out of that uh, that's like um, uh, uh, reasonable uh, and can be done on a volunteer basis and so forth. Um, and then uh, the, the other piece of this was of governance for us was what we're calling federated diplomacy because uh, these first two pieces kind of can apply to like any web forum from the 2000s but um, there's this extra layer that's the federated diplomacy layer which is the governance of, of relationships between a server and then other fediverse servers and accounts uh, because and that's the literally the the novel thing that federation brings in is you have communities that may have different codes of conduct and social norms and so forth that are now interacting uh, and that causes interesting frictions um, and, and interesting problems. Um, and so what I want to do is I'm going to talk through um, some high level conclusions and findings and then I'm going to zoom in on the findings from just one section of the paper that I principally wrote which was about like um, open source, where, where open source Communities and open source tooling can kind of fit into this, given the audience I'm speaking to here. So, um, I just want to lay out that you know we put forward a, our own conceptual framework around this. We think the Fediverse is better conceptualized as a social component of the open web, rather than some kind of social platform or social network. Um, this matters not so much maybe to the people in this room, for whom that might be an obvious statement. But there's a lot of people out there in industry and so forth, uh, and in government specifically, because um, you know legislatures have their own specific definitions of what a platform is and so forth. And there's a lot of interesting legal questions of if I'm running a social uh, uh, service for 50 of my friends, as I do, um, you know, what are my legal liabilities and so forth, and how does that relate to when governments say platforms need to do X, Y, and Z? Does that apply to me? Does that not? Um, 
uh, I won't read all this, but I figured I would just put that up there. And and we want to we want to stress that for us, it seems pretty clear that the Fediverse operates according to the pre-platform logic of the open web much more than it does to like it's it's more useful to talk about forums from the uh, 2000s or BBSs and that kind of thing when you're talking about the Fediverse than it is to like look at how Facebook has operated over the last you know 20 years. Um, so I want to just go over some best practices we found talking to different servers, um, uh, mostly just for everyone's benefit here. I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time on these, but we found that it's a great idea to consider your governance and leadership models as early as possible, not because you can perfectly predict anything, but just to like think about them and don't like charge in thoughtlessly into this sort of thing. Even just knowing what kind of options are out there so that when your current governance model starts to, to show its, fray its edges and, and become less um, useful to you, you can already be prepared knowing that there are other governance models out there and perhaps paths to moving toward them. Um, uh, in the case of Mastodon, and a lot of this is generalizable to the Fediverse and social software in general, but since we did specifically look at Mastodon, we had a lot of specific Mastodon and Mastodon fork related things. Um, we recommend, you know, basically moderation starts when you as a server administrator decide what your registration model is going to be. Uh, there's a huge difference between having an open registration model where anyone can sign up for an account on your social media server and a moderated one where people fill out um, uh, an application form and uh, and then like the sort of invite only basically private club model uh, and there's we had a lot of really interesting insights from um, there you know we talked to admins who will open it up for a while and then close it down and then and then change uh, as their server needs it and then we have other people who are like nope we have to be open because of our principles and um, here's here's all the the problems that we have as a result of that, but we're willing to, to, to deal with it. Um, uh, and then there's some admins who are just like adamant that, you know, do not have open signups, just, you know, like have people fill out, you know, application forms and so forth. It was, we got a very interesting constellation of, um, of perspectives on that. But basically, but the, but the main thing that we pulled from that is, it's really important to think about registration models. And, and later on, when I go to sort of technical and FOSS type of, uh, of um, recommendations, um, I want us to think about providing more fine-grained control over registration than what is currently offered in open source um, social software. Um, you know, we recommend seeking out moderators with strong online and offline community management experience. It might make, you know, it might, uh, you know, probably, you know, if like someone comes to you and says, hey, I've been moderating a Discord for a long time. I want to moderate your Fediverse server and you know them kind of like that makes a lot of sense. But actually people who and that's good and those people are useful and also people who have spent time moderating in offline IRL communities can be extremely useful as well in community management or moderation positions on these servers. So um, so we just wanted to stress that like there's multiple kinds of moderation and community management experience that um, can really um, help in this sort of thing. And we, we saw that as a repeated pattern where really critical members of moderation teams, it was actually their first time doing technical moderation, but they had, had a rich history of, you know, running in-person events and that kind of thing. So that was kind of cool to see. Um, you know, uh, well, let's see, we had a, you know, a, having a server team with a, that sort of is a broad representation of the community that you intend to serve, that usually goes over um, pretty well. Um, uh, we, uh, we found a repeated pattern was people creating a generic, well-publicized, um, just sort of front-facing account, like mods at server, um, or, you know, team at server. Um, weirdly, that's not something that Mastodon provides out of the box. Um, it kind of creates that in terms of like a default admin account. But 
one of our recommendations is that the software really should provide a way for um, there to be a team account that multiple people have access to and there's permissions that can be granted and taken off of that. Like it would be great to, you know, Mastodon lets you um, tag users as moderators. Uh, it would be great if that access control also gave access to certain accounts that then people could um, interact from and there is a common index and so forth. Um, uh, we recommend people document plentifully uh, and in ways that make it easy to understand the desired character of the server, responsibilities, and so forth. Um, we link to a lot of examples of public-facing um, documentation uh, from different teams, uh, so hopefully people can, can look at that and get inspired um, by what's there. Um, a lot of it, a lot of what we saw, because these are volunteer teams, is that documentation really... Um, uh, was like how they scaled um, more so than anything else was, you know, even if you don't have a big team uh, and you can't have 24 seven coverage um, uh, for moderation, that sort of thing, having detailed documentation was one of the things that really supplemented um, that lack of labor. Um, uh, let's see. Um, we, let's see, I don't know, skip that one. Uh, let's see. Right, um, onboarding was a constant problem for um, uh, for teams that had um, these sort of mid-size, you know, several hundred to several thousand user um, uh, situations. Uh, this is this ties in with the documentation stuff, but basically, the best organized and best prepared servers that we talked to were ones that had an onboarding process of some kind. Whether that was like, here's a bunch of documents you should read. We're gonna we're gonna you're a new moderator coming on. We're gonna like pair you up with a buddy moderator, essentially, for a little bit. Um, you know, that was, uh, did you want to add something, or was that just a, yeah, support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and and in terms of that pairing up, we noticed that the best uh, outcomes came where um, during training, people used specific cases and complex decisions um, to uh, to train people up on. This also ties back into documentation. So, like, if a mod team has a, um, really tricky moderation thing that they go through, it might behoove you to document that experience. Not maybe necessarily for the public because moderation stuff can be very, um, you know, uh, 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 personal and uh, not the kind of thing you want to like air out to everybody, but you can have your internal documentation like here's this scenario that we encountered once and it could be really useful to take a new moderator step by step through that. And if you actually have that documented somewhere, then um, you're going to be able to um, uh, to more effectively run them through that rather than just like kind of like go off of your memory. Um, a lot of these teams worked with volunteer or paid legal counsel. Um, uh, it is It can get expensive and if the whole situation around Legal support for these small communities really sucks right now, basically. And um, uh, I'll get to that in my recommendations as well. Um, you know, uh, build out more human, technical, and financial capacity than you, than you think will be needed. You know, always have some, some uh, you should basically always be running where you think like it's way too easy because then when spikes happen and it gets hard, you will be um, uh, 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 resourced to actually deal with them. Um, it's important to communicate transparently with, with your members. Um, one of the interesting things that I often have to bring up when I find myself in rooms with like trust and safety professionals and, um, legislators and lawyers and things like that is like, Hey, when you talk about transparency, what you mean is like quarterly reports that can be filed with the SEC or something like that. When individual users talk about transparency, they want to be able to understand why moderation actions were taken. Uh, they want uh, a, a human touch, essentially. And so there's this really weird divide between what kind of a technocratic ruling class considers to be transparency and what individual everyday users um, conceive of it as. Um, and then, of course, there are there are a, a number of different admin moderator, um, you know, forums and discords and places like that. Uh, we linked to a couple public ones here. There are a lot of private ones as well. And attitudes around these things vary wildly. Some people have really bad experiences in in um, moderator communities. 
and some people uh, find them very helpful and uh, it's probably a good idea to like dip your toe in multiple and find which ones have a community that like makes the most sense for you to get support from. Um, so uh, uh, I'm gonna actually skip over that for now because that's like, I'll, I'll, I'll jump back to that if, if it's relevant to, uh, to questions people bring up. Um, so I'm gonna go straight into this part where I talk about um, uh, recommendations for core software developers. And then I have another one that's a recommendation for software developers in general. So like third party opportunities uh, in addition. Um, uh, we also make a bunch of recommendations for funders as well, because it's like, because we have, because there are organizations like NLNet and so forth that, you know, are providing grants that, that flow money into this ecosystem. And basically we want to say like, Hey, if you're giving grants out, like here's a document full of recommendations based on our research that you might want to use as a guideline for this sort of thing. So, um, you know, our, our, our biggest top level software, um, recommendation is to build pathways for inter-server communication. Um, in Mastodon, certainly, there's no way for a moderator on one server to talk to a moderator on another server about governance-related decisions. Um, of course, this is a huge can of worms because um, when I get a report from another server that might be um, uh, like a part of a harassment campaign in and of itself and so forth, but there's basically... I, it becomes clear that there needs to be a social network built on top of the social network um, uh, for admins to talk to each other and make uh, decisions and maybe tag each other as like identify as like, oh, um, I trust the admins on that server over there. And so we're going to have a little mutual handshake. And then that means that we're going to be able to share certain like maybe moderation data with each other or just open certain channels of communication with one another and to have that built into the software. Whether this lives in the, I think ideally we would be federating this over ActivityPub itself and we could, um, and there could basically be a software client inside the software, like a Fediverse client inside the Fediverse client for um, uh, admins and moderators to talk to one another. But that's, uh, it's a, it's a non-trivial, there's gonna need to be trust and safety stuff built into that because if any of you have ever been an admin or a mod, you'll know that admins and mods love to harass each other too. So, um, uh, so you know, uh, right. And then we have the one on top of that where we have the, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I, I figure if we have at least one level of recursion, that'll get us uh, uh, some benefit. And then if it gets messy from there, at least we're better off than we were before. Um, you know, I make some technical recommendations. I think if servers could identify an inbox for inbound admin communication, uh, like an inbox in the activity pub sense, um, that could be um, really useful. Um, you know, it's, we basically need to come up with more standard locations for this kind of communication to happen so that future collaborative moderation tools can know, there can be like a well-known address where a moderation tool can you know, uh, identify inboxes and outboxes and that kind of thing in the activity pub sense. I'm not going to get too technical about it, but um, uh, this is this would also help us build affordances for lock list sharing and allow list management and all those other kinds of things, which like uh, exist in kind of an ad hoc way, but it would be really great to have them built into some kind of um, uh, greater understanding uh, in sort of a, a like a social graph for this kind of stuff. Um, you know, uh, I think allow list federation uh, in, in the Mastodon context needs to become a first class feature. For those of you who don't know, um, when you start a Fediverse server, it by default basically just, um, the way federation works is as you make connections, as your users make connections out into the broader Fediverse or incoming connections come in because you told someone you just started a server and then they added you, um, uh, that sort of like builds, organically builds out this network and those connections are allowed by default. Um, allow list federation is you start your server and it's an island and then you say, oh, I have friends on these three servers who I trust. So I'm going to allow, sorry, I'm going to allow um, uh, uh, federation with those servers. And then as you discover more, you know, it could, 
and there, there are many different uh, modes that it can take. It can, uh, it can basically be like every time someone wants to follow you from a new server, um, first it goes to an admin queue, and then the admin decides whether or not they go look at the code of conduct of the server and decide whether or not that goes on the allow list or not. There's many different forms this can take. Um, uh, the, um, the problem is that while Mastodon does technically allow for allow list federation, um, it's not built into the UI. There's no affordances in the moderation tools to manage it really. And uh, it's basically just a Unix environment variable that you have to flip, which means if you're on managed hosting, you're not gonna have access to this. It's really only available to people who are running on a VPS or something like that and have root access to the server that, um, that they have access to. So, uh, so basically, you know, this needs to be a viable option and it's not really a viable option except for like tinkerers and, and hackers right now. Um, and then to my earlier point, I, we, we, just, we, we think we need to standardize and enrich the tools that control who gets to sign up for an account. I think there's a lot more thought that, and features that could be put into the sign up process. Um, we have like basically three gradations on Mastodon right now, open, invite only, and um, like application based. And I think there's just more thinking that could be done around that um, and, uh, and tools that could be built around that sort of thing. Um, and in fact, we noticed some server teams actually like they would build their own like complex application process form outside of Mastodon using like, you know, uh, a bunch of Google Forms or that kind of thing um, because uh, the affordances weren't really built in for them. Um, that's all kind of like core software stuff. This is more for third party in addition to core software developers. Um, you know, we could imagine a, a governance focused dashboard interfacing with many Fediverse projects. Um, there are some, um, you know, I've talked about like a neighborhoods concept. I would like to be able to to tag other servers that are uh, that share social norms and uh, uh, with mine, so that we can federate some subset of content just to each other. Um, there's also um, uh, there's also uh, uh, there, there's basically a lot of room there, and it would require both. I'd like to see um, both like the Mastodon API open up more to this kind of thing, as well as people, uh, as, as well as this kind of stuff actually federating over ActivityPub. Um, uh, and uh, I get into it in the report, but that's sort of the, the high level thing and uh, happy to answer questions about that um, as well. Um, you know, there's, uh, so CSAM is a term of art from the trust and safety community. It refers to child sexual abuse material. Um, it is uh, sort of the radioactive waste of um, social media in that it's the kind of thing where in most legal jurisdictions, if you as an admin um, are caught hosting that sort of thing under certain circumstances, you could be liable, you could find yourself fined or have jail time or that kind of thing, even if you had nothing to do with the, um, the content itself. Um, I will say just because I don't like to fear monger in a US context, if you as an admin don't no, it's only once you know the material is on your server, like personally, that you are actually obligated to report it. Um, so um, if something's just cached, you know, because it like came through somewhere else and as long as nobody knows, as long, basically as long as you don't know about it and it hasn't been reported to you, you are not legally on the hook for doing any kind of reporting. But once you are alerted to it, you are legally on the hook for reporting in a US context at least to NECMEC, which is the National Center for Endangered and Missing Children. They have an API and so forth and, and an online form. Um, it would be really cool if we had um, automated tools for handling that sort of thing. Um, there are also um, uh, uh, legal requirements such as if someone tells you there is CSAM on your server, you cannot delete it. You have to hold on to it for 90 days. Um, and the reason for that is they want, in case, um, uh, you know, law enforcement wants to take a look at it and do something with it, right? Um, so technically it is, while your, your instinct will be to nuke it from space, um, you're actually not supposed to do that. You're supposed to hold on to it for 90 days. And so, um, 
it would be pretty cool to have a system where you can say, okay, I found this piece of content, I press a button, it gets reported through the API to NECMEC and then put in a cryptographic sealed container with an auditing system that basically says, you know, whenever anyone accesses this, there's a, there's some kind of cryptographic audit that, that, that lets you know who did that. Um, and that should exist. It doesn't, I don't know why. Um, uh, yeah. Did we have a comment? Yeah, I'm gonna have a Q&A so we can talk about it. Um, there are, um, if, uh, there's also con a whole industry of content filtering software out there. Um, there's software like Thorn that is used by big social media companies to, um, uh, like what they do is they provide uh, hashes. So basically they have a database of hashes of known illegal content and these are perceptual hashes so like they even take care of like if content is mirrored or cropped and things like that and then you know social media companies will take when you upload a picture they run it against that and then uh, if it's identified as um, known CSAM then you can take action on it. Um, the problem is that these are big enterprise companies. They're they're built for dealing with companies like Facebook and and uh, or Meta and um, you know other, basically big businesses. They're it's enterprise software, and you have to do handshake deals and that kind of thing. There's no, it's not like an open API that anyone can plug into. Um, if Toss is working with Thorn, which is one of those providers, to basically act as a proxy. Um, so hopefully, in the near future, if Toss will be able to sort of be who individual server operators can plug into a service there. And then IFTAS will do all the dirty work of like, you know, having smoky backroom deals with big enterprise software vendors. So you don't have to worry about that as an individual um, moderator. Um, and then just, just generally, we just need so much better moderation tooling. Um, you know, we found there's, um, just as a, as a as an example, um, if you go to the, I have some screenshots of this in the the big report. I guess I can pull it up. Um, this is the big report, the big 155 pager. Um, I'll go just to pull up this screenshot. Um, I think it was towards the. Right. Uh, uh, it's a little small, but you don't need to read the text. Just. Um, in Mastodon, when I get, at least in version um, 4.2.9, which is when I took this screenshot, um, when, I, when I look at the list of incoming reports, like these are spam reports, for example, that I made up, um, there's no way, there's no check mark boxes on the left-hand side there. I can't just say select all and then, and then, and then trash all, like, which is silly. Um, we actually found out that... Um, one person, one person reported to us that what they would do is instead they would go to the account moderation site uh, uh, page. Um, and especially if there's a spam wave, you're likely to see a bunch of new accounts that have popped up. You can sort by what the newest known accounts are. And then this does have check boxes. And then they could go through and check those and then delete all the ones that are like garbage gobbledygook or whatever. Um, which was very clever and also made me want to tear my hair out. It's like, why can't we just have a select all, you know, um, uh, feature uh, over there? And it made me want to sit down and just write it, which in theory I could, and maybe I will over the next few months, but I had other things I was doing. Um, so, um, you know, basically like, and, and what's, what, what kind of kills me is that when I show the Mastodon moderation tooling to moderation experts from major social media like sites, uh, they actually go, wow, this is really good. Um, and it's because uh, major social media sites solve it by just like throwing workers into horrible situations with bad tooling and they just solve it with volume. So like there's not really an incentive to make good tools for the big social media companies. I would love to see more innovation in this space where it is desperately, I mean, it's needed everywhere, but it's really needed when you have five moderators. I also wanted to point out, by the way, uh, I don't want to take, oh God, I only have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, we just did doing some back of the envelope calculations. You know, everyone we talked to was like, oh, we have such terrible coverage for moderation. You know, we're, um, we're a thousand people and we only have five moderators. Um, 
when we everyone that we talked to seemed to have like roughly a one moderator to two or three hundred user um uh situation sometimes better than that sometimes worse but it was about one to a hundred on that on that level um if you go by stats provided by meta um their moderators are like it's the ratio is more like one to a hundred thousand or one to a million um granted you know in theory they have all these other tools like thorn and stuff to help them out but um i think it's just demonstrative that we have people who are like my coverage is so bad and it's basically the equivalent of like a personal chef uh, uh you know versus uh <laughs> versus some other situation it's like i'm so sorry i was only able to make this like one you know hand cooked meal for like 100 people you know uh like like okay yeah i mean that's okay <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, I want to stop here because I want to leave time for Q and A. Um, so thanks for listening to this and I'm happy to just like answer whatever, uh, that thanks. Uh, in the, in the purple. Thank you so much. I've done a lot of thinking about business models for federation. I'd love to talk to you more to anybody else about that topic, but briefly, I guess, um, a negative I have, I know that those are needs. Activity Pub is very, very useful. Um, uh, I believe primarily because of its simplicity, the open standard. Mm -hmm. So requiring that tooling in the mass implementation of the Activity Pub as a protocol, I don't think is a good idea. And I think we argue. Um, but at the federation level, the, the concept of a, of a, uh, shared services cooperative where the idea of a shared services cooperative it's kind of a uh, consumer co-op on steroids basically imagine administrators and managers of individual sites of uh, servers sharing the cost right of services they can't afford alone so hiring a lawyer yeah they're already there sorry there already is one uh such uh there's an organization called jordage uh, they basically are a bunch of servers that share a big Amazon S3 bucket so that, uh, and then they split the cost so that, and, and, and yeah. Describing over and over and over all the needs for tools, since they are kind of at the shared services level, I could imagine, say, XMPP being the, the connection that would allow for peer encrypted communication without the centralized uh, services. Or you, I could imagine a lawyer just signing I'm going to help my clients form a cooperative so they can all hire me to do their legal mm -hmm. presentation if they do have an issue as to yeah. the server admin. Yeah. There's lots of work that could be done out there. I'd really like to hear. I, I agree. There's there's so much cool work that could be done. Um, yeah. Uh, Laura. Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, I think there are tons of open source custom safety tools in development right now. It's like a very emerging thing. So that's kind of exciting. Um, that's where how Federated is focusing on this too. So, kind of tied in here is like, part of what we all of these things, like, how do we attract, I mean, not the amount of self or just like the amount of activity of, we need so much more with the developer training. And, um, and so we kind of had to just say, like, well, like make new tools or whatever. Um, and kind of to your point, it's like there's people already need tools, but then it's there's not enough like assets for the competing moderators who actually have to implement them in a way mm -hmm. like how do you find how do you connect yeah. yeah. Ariata? So um uh... Other implementations of Fido Mastodon do have some more robust filtering capabilities. Uh, there's Morona's MRF, uh, MISPI has some sort of policy framework that's similar to MRF. Um, so you can actually use those policy frameworks to kind of hook into third party services like Photo DNA and, and Thorn. Uh, actually, in Corona itself, there's MRF policy that you can install that checks attachments against the DNA. 
you have to have a uh, what they call a uh, they call it an NSFW server because it's just bad to name. But anyway, <laughs> that server basically mediates it, it screens the attachments against those APIs. Um, the key thing, really, outside of automated moderation tooling, because like. The largest issue um, that I see at, uh, running an instance um, is whenever like a high profile user posts something, they get crap flooded. And we can definitely automate the hell out of dealing with crap. Like, can you can you describe what a crap flood is? Okay, so the highest profile incident that I can think of right now would be uh, when uh, people of color post anything on Mastodon and then it gets blown up and then they get flooded with like thousands of comments that are basically just the N word. Right. Um, okay, thanks. That, that, is, that, that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yep. I, we, we already have. Yeah, we, we would say coordinated adversarial behavior. Yes. <laughs> we already know how to solve that issue. Like, so, like, I think that's like a key thing that, you know, we need a firewall and all of mm -hmm. these um, activity pub implementations to filter out stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that way we can focus on the actual moderation signals. Um, and at that point, when when you have moderators that aren't having to deal with things that can be trivially moderated with automation, such as these crap floods, um, then you don't need as many many moderation staff. Like for example, I just looked up on Treehouse. We have like fourteen active moderators right now for five hundred and sixty people. Yep. Um, so you do need more moderators, but you don't need too many more moderators. Yeah, yeah. I think a good ratio is about uh, 15 to 1, <laughs> so like one moderator for every 15 users or so. Yeah, um, nice. And then the key thing is you just really need solid playbooks to deal with. The playbooks are really, yeah, the playbooks are really important. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we had another comment I wanted to make sure we get uh, to hear from everyone. Um. Uh, I'm curious about like if what kinds of strategies people had to manage burnout among like within a moderation team once it did show up. Yeah, that that's probably the main problem with our sampling method, which is people who have been through burnout aren't going to participate in a study like ours. Um, we um, we we uh, and we actually highlight that in our limitations section of the paper. Um, the people that we talked to um, acknowledged some burnout. Um, some of them would do things like have um, uh, just like rotating um, positions, like maybe they wouldn't be moderators 100% of the time. You'd do like a three month shift or something and then um, uh, and then rotate off and then rotate back on. Kind of similar with any kind of ops on call type of position. Uh, but most of the time it was just like, yeah, it sucks. Um, uh, and, uh, we're not sure how we, uh, we deal with it. How are we on time? All right. Oh, uh, anyone, I, anyone who hasn't spoken yet want to, uh, I guess, uh, you, and then if we have time, um, you, yes. I'll be short. Um, I am one of the joint moderators on a system that has a geographic local. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm also from the era of Usenet News and uh, running news servers. Yep. One of the things that really made a difference in the Usenet era was that Usenet men from um, all over the world would get together at some point along the yep. way and as either part of Usenet or just other events. Have you seen the social aspects of moderation networks informed by in-person connections this is a relatively new network. yeah it's everyone yes it is um it's slowly starting to happen through events that occur there was uh, there's uh i've met a fair number of other moderators at um in-person events but like i don't think there's been like a marquee like use nicks type um 
type of thing to bring people together. I would imagine that is on the roadmap for a group like Iftas who want to who want to like coordinate. Like they would they, they seem to me to be like the natural group to sort of like do a, an event or something, you know. Uh, but yeah, it hasn't. It's mostly been ad hoc at different at other events where people are likely to be like here at Fosse. It's like, you know, this is where I'll meet like uh, Ariana for the first time or whatever. And it's like, cool, we're both mods. Um, but yeah. Um, that good question. And and I think it's important to have these in-person gatherings as well. Um, yeah. Would you be able to provide an example of the moderator limiting tool? Uh, the limiting tool? Um, uh, uh, like, uh, well, I can't, I can't demo right now just cause, uh, I am, uh, unfortunate. Like I, it could, it could, um, show info from my server that I wouldn't want to like show in a live demo, but, um, uh, there, there, we do, we do have screenshots, uh, in the report that sort of like walk through. So that hopefully that would be useful. Um, and I'm also happy to answer questions like afterwards too. So, all right. Looks like we're at time. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out.